Ninety percent of that was just waiting for Amazon. Pangotan 2015. Um, the tools that we build in Ubuntu Juju spe specifically are all designed around automation, right? Everything you see here is an API. This web GUI is just talking to a Juju state server via an API. That means the entire thing is designed to be automated. Like my entire goal, I've been successful. If you're like, man. I saw this thing about MariaDB, and I really want to try that encryption table thing, which I didn't know existed, by the way. That's really awesome, right? And I, I really want to try it. Um, I don't want you to go home and have to be like, ah, oh, and then read a bunch of stuff. I want to get you up and running on Maria as fast as possible, right? On the OS, my job is to get you what you want and stay the hell out of your way. So traditionally, the way uh, we, we delivered software is basically Debian packages, right? And I'm going to give you a little bit of history lesson because I'm going to kind of explain to you um, why Debian and Ubuntu are so great and why they're so absolutely terrible at the same time. And I know that sounds like blasphemy, but it's okay. So we release an enterprise LTS release of Ubuntu every two years. And then we have, in between, we have little six month ones. That's mostly for, uh, for desktop people, right? Something like 91% of all our instances in Amazon are LTS versions, right? What does that tell you? Server people only use LTS versions. Ding. Okay, so that's really great. The problem is, is that we sync with Debian and we grab Debian software and then we sync it in. Unless it's something we really, really care about, like say OpenStack, and then we'll go ahead and pull pull in those bits and do the integration, and then you get a Ubuntu OpenStack and it's amazing and that's great. It sucks sometimes for people like this guy because they have their own schedule, right? And they release really great product. And one of the most frustrating things about having to work with upstream projects in the years that I was doing it is if his release schedule and our release schedule are not synced, then he, he kind of misses the boat. He doesn't get into Debian. He doesn't get into Ubuntu. And then by the time it gets to you, you've got a two-year-old version of MariaDB, right? And then you can't get it to work. And then you bother him about it, right? And then he hates that. So what does he do? He has to make a repository of things, right? And then effectively that removes us, and then QA becomes an issue, and it's kind of a mess, right? Can, can we all agree that kind of sucks? That's not That's ideal. That's like OS 7 is running MariaDB 5.5. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, exactly. This, we didn't make 10 at one time. Right. So I remember for a while, it's like, man, why can't I get MariaDB in Ubuntu? You were like, well, we need to get our Debian pack. So first it needs to get the Debian, then we need the sync, and then it's like, well, can you guys help us, right? How many of you have made Debian packages before? It's very difficult. It's, it's not a good time. Now, if you're you, doing this at work internally, it's horrible as long as it works, right? But if, you're, if you want something to be in Debian, one of the greatest things about Debian is Debian policy, right? The packaging and format itself doesn't really matter. It's the policy that makes it possible. So um, for us, it became a problem. And this is just one database, right? Like, have you ever app get installed WordPress? And it's like really, really terrible. And ain't nobody updating that thing because you can't because there's packages that have to run as root and it's really horrible. So you got to be careful. You, so we can't just let everybody update their own packages in the distribution because you have to check each one. Like a machine can't do that, and we've tried this. Like you actually have to have an experienced Debian packager to peer review and that kind of stuff. So what? So what does a software like MariaDB then need to do? They need to like figure out how to package your stuff, and then they need to do that for Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS. There's always like the one Susa guy in the room that's packages, whatever, right? And that really sucks for them, right? Because effectively, when you go to their web page, it's like, Ubuntu gives you these packages. Don't use them, right? And from my perspective, it's like, well, why do we have them in, what about the guy who doesn't notice that and just app gets installed stuff? So that really sucks. Um, so one of the really, really nice things is that we do with Juju, and it does a bunch of really great things, but my favorite thing that it does is it totally takes me out of the equation, right? It delivers to you Collins version of what this MariaDB cluster should look like. And then I just do what I'm really good at, which is the operating system and orchestration and launching it and doing this. And we effectively, I was the middleman, I don't really want to be the middleman anymore because that sucks. Got you yelling at me, I've got him yelling at me, and I'm trying to, you know, do that. I was like, hey man, why don't you guys just talk? And then I'll just be hanging out back, running the OS like I should be. So, um, I think that's really powerful, that's really great, because now the MariaDB that you get in Ubuntu is basically uh, delivered to you by the MariaDB guys, and if it's broken, then you can just talk to them, and then that's fine. Really great thing for him is when he fixes things, when he makes new releases, he no longer has to wait 
for us being a gatekeeper as far as winners and releases, right? All these chunks here are decoupled from the operating system, which is really great. That means when he gets a new version and you decide you want to upgrade, I have nothing to do with this, right? We do testing and a whole bunch of other stuff, but you know, theoretically, you're you're uh, you're basing your service off off what the best upstream fix, uh, gives you to offer. So what I've done here is uh, I've deployed I, I deployed these here, and I've got these in master and slave replication. I kind of want to show you how I did that, um, and then we'll get to this little cluster over here in a minute. So if you look at so this is the uh, this is kind of a representation of what exactly is going on here. Over here is my list of machines which scrolled off. So you can see we have nine plus zero. So ten machines that are currently paying on Amazon, so they're really happy that it's going to enter our credit card. Um, here are all the services that I've deployed, right? Here's the master and the slave. I created one just called MariaDB to show you I can do that. Uh, the load balancer, Molinox, and the blog, D3 Miami. And um, whether those can be hit from uh, the outside network, so you explicitly have to say when you want to expose something to the internet. Um, the code that we use to deploy these things are called charms, and I'll show you the MariaDB charm here in a minute, so you can modify it and do awesome things with it. So this is kind of telling me the exact version that I'm running, Trusty Zoom, uh, 1404. So you can see I deployed a 12041 just to kind of show you how that works. Um, in the future, this will either say like the CentOS version or the Debian version. Or the version. Um, Where it says trust, it doesn't say CentOS separate. Right, right. I don't, CentOS doesn't have nicknames, right? Just numbers? You think so? I don't know. Um, and then, of course, the public addresses to these things version of Doodra I'm running, the state of the service. Um, so when you first launch, obviously we have to wait for Amazon for your cloud to give you a, uh, a machine. So like I said, most of the time is spent waiting on it. What I did is I deployed a bunch of things, kind of waited around, then a whole bunch of hooks fired off, and everything was automated. Um, but you do have to wait for Amazon to actually create a VM for you and give you the then we install an agent and then it does things and whatnot. You know, so and of course the ports that we use and whatnot. And interestingly enough, in a kind of inception style thing. The admin itself that we're controlling this is also deployed into this cloud. And then this is the service I'm logged into to show you this view. So any questions so far? Have I lost someone? Awesome. OK. So what I'm going to do is basically launch something similar to this, except um, I'm going to do it live. Then we're going to let it run in the background so you can see how dynamic, how dynamic this is. Right? So. A lot of people get really hung up on the deployment bits, right? They say, oh, well, Chef and Puppet can do this. I have, I have manifests that deploy things. Um, deploying services into a cloud is a solved problem, right? I'm not, I'm not here to say that I am revolutionary in any aspect of it, uh, whatsoever. What makes these charms really, really great is that you can change your mind, and it's dynamic and life cycle. So it's not one of those tools where you deploy, and then you messed up, and then you have to tear down, and then resets uh, stuff back up. So for example, in this case, if you go here to the amount of slaves, here's the machine view if you care about that, but that's not important right now. So I have two slaves running right now. Um, and what I can do is spend a lot more money and add another slave, let's say, to our Maria cluster. I uh, know this is on Amazon. This is on Amazon currently. Oh, I forgot to mention, thank you for mentioning that. Um, I can also do this locally. The reason I don't do it locally is I'm also giving a presentation on this laptop and launching all of these instances on the laptop <laughs> um, is not, not very conducive. Um, even in containers, even in containers. Yeah, right. So, so see here, see that little bar? Right, we now, it's just the reallocating units here, there's all live. So what's happened here is, uh, I don't know, my blog's getting a lot of traffic, so I need more slaves, so I'm just going to fire that up, and that's going to happen. I can also trim that down, right, and then those nodes go away um, as well. All right, so as you can see here, it's really kind of about being dynamic enough, right? So if I wanted to, um, let's say our blog is getting pretty popular here, I could do... 
that better? So let's deploy an HA proxy and let's call it awesome load balancer. Right. Now that code, that charm that I call that's called HA proxy, um, we'll install HA proxy, we'll ask Amazon for an instance, and then we'll take that charm and effectively run it as root on that instance. Right? Um, this is why these are peer reviewed, by the way. Um, and then we're going to install HA proxy. And like I said, deploying software into the cloud, not very, not very sexy, right? Um, hopefully a lot of you already know how to do this. Right, and then here's that box, that representation. Now I'm OCD, so I have to have it like, exactly. This is gonna be our awesome load balancer for our blog, right? And as we went back, we know that Colin's doing a great job. Uh, no problem. So we've asked for more slaves, and that's gonna take like 10 minutes. Amazon to spin off all those instances. That's, um, that's some parallel, by the way. Uh, we just basically ask Amazon through their API, please give us this, or Azure, or whoever. Um, but like I said, see, we make it so you don't have to care about the cloud specific API that happens there. So this look. You're running MariaDB. What's that? You're running MariaDB on the Google? This is on Amazon. Amazon. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Several instances. Several. So over here, so over here I had one, one unit of the master, and over here, I had one, I had two units, I added four, and they're still allocated, right? But remember how I said this is all kind of about being live? So when they wrote this, they were really smart enough to, to keep the service operating. So I don't have to really care about, oh no, I need to schedule. Like they kind of handle that for me. As these machines come up, right, then the charm runs, then MariaDB is installed, then they connect to the master, and all that happens. Right, right. What's really great about this, and I wanted to reiterate that, I basically can't mess this up because the people who know how to connect slaves to masters are the ones that authored this chart. So that's really awesome for me. I can totally skip that chapter of the book and go right to what I really want to do, which is actually learn to use the service instead of configuring it. Um, so I'm going to fire up that little balancer while, while things are yellow and turning green depending on what day, what mood Amazon's in. Um, I do want to point something out, something that is really cool that we do for you. Those, any of you guys deploying on Amazon like for work or, or professionally or how do you like it? Uh, I'm just starting into it and it's a lot of fun. Uh, it is, isn't it? It makes you never want to buy a server again. <laughs> um, something that we do do automatically is we put stuff in different uh, subzones for you, which is a really, really nice um, feature, which means that like, there's no chance that your instances are going to be like in the same rack or whatever, so we kind of... Uh, be different physical racks. These, these, how does subzones work in Amazon? They're remember. called availability zones. Yes, yeah, right. So we kind of automatically spread between different AZs. And you can also set this explicitly. So, but if you're in a different AZ, you're guaranteed to be on a different racket. Right, exactly. They actually make stronger. So this is the same region, but different racket. Definitely. Right, right. So this is in. Power supply. Yeah. US East 1 is in. How you get redundant site that works with hardware failure in their class. Right. And US East has five AZs in that one region. Right. So this is in Virginia. So yeah, your chances. Only the Virginia one has these are maps. All of these are in Virginia. Actually. Yeah, all of these. So each of these maps to one of those. It was going for high reliability for the slave in a data center. Right. Good. Right. Physical location. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and actually, availability zones sometimes are separate physical locations that are just very close together. Yeah. But they're not the same building. Sometimes we get things like say a hurricane. Right, I was going to say, I was going to say the last time, this is awesome, except the last time when there was that hurricane that went through, right? So, remember how we said it's really great to be able to move your workloads in between clouds earlier, right? You also can do that within different, within the same cloud provider, right? So you're like, shit, there's a hurricane coming. I remember last time there was a hurricane, that wasn't good, right? So you can be able to take this model, this right here, export it, shove it onto West Coast instead, which is what everybody doing, was doing in Amazon, right? Everyone knew, oh, last time there was a hurricane, it was a big deal. So what were people doing? Moving stuff to Europe, moving stuff to the West Coast, and then everything comes back to normal, and then what do you want to do? You want to move it back, depending on cost. There's, US East 1 always, is, to me, is the one I want to be at, because that one always seems to have the best features. And 
the newest hardware and things like that. It's what did Azure do? What role can what did Azure that's open up in Des Moines to get in the workplace there to cater for Tornado? Yeah, yeah. And they built a proof against Tornadoes already. That's excellent. That's excellent. Now, one thing we can't do, and I hate to point out limitations of my own stuff because I love it so much, is what we currently can't do is put a master on Amazon and US East One and a bunch of slaves in Azure. Well, yes. you can do that if you use manual. Yeah, but I don't want you guys to do that. However, we are working on it. It can, it can, it can be done. However, I just want to point out that that is no... Right, that would be the, the awesome ultimate thing, right? Be able to, yeah. Okay, so which one's cheaper today? Yeah, <laughs> let me put my throwaway cash stuff over there, right? But it's, I mean, no matter how good we get at automating, there's also network limitations. So <coughs> you have to think hard about that. Yes, there's a reason that you can't magically just do that. And it's not because we're... Well, so VMware has that. Um, okay. Management director, I think they call it. Right, cool. How much does that cost? <laughs> this one, right? <laughs> So I don't know the cost, you know, because I, I don't write the checks. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, so let's, let's do this. It might not work any better than that. It's not open, so it's Yeah. All right. So we've got an instance that Amazon gives us for our awesome load balancer, and we have the PenguinCon blog. These are all in different instances. They're not really talking. What? No. Oh, and all my slaves are up. That's awesome. So that's great. Um, so I've scaled out my database layer. Now I need to scale out my application, right? I don't know how many of you have tried to scale out WordPress. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, not a good time. Not a good time. Um, however, because everything I'm showing you here is, is kind of different from the way, especially the way I used to write custom uh, puppet modules. My puppet modules are very, very site specific, right? So I worked at Oakland University in Rochester Hills, right? And like I would know the Linux guys at U of M, right? And they we would deploy all the same services, right? But it was like, well, how are you doing this? And I can't really use any of it because it's all like homegrown stuff. Um, and my stuff is homegrown. And then the stuff at Wayne is homegrown. So you you'd be at a log and be like, man, wouldn't it be awesome if we all shared the same stuff? Then what happens? You're all arguing about tools for the next two years, and nothing really happens. Um, with Juju, we really, really force you. Some people don't like this, but that's fine. We force you to separate your config. From, from the logic of the service. Um, so all the stuff that's site specific to you, we kind of have in a uh, config and we split that from the service itself. This allows us to really, really reshare co code <coughs> with everyone else that's generally reusable. Um, and this has a bunch of benefits. So for example, the WordPress blog that I'm deploying now is a kind of a piece of junk that was written by my now one of my coworkers who like was entering the contest and wanted to win a bunch of money, so he did all this like that. So really sweet, that does like Nginx load balance, totally awesome, right? And then when our IS team at Canonical, we deploy a lot of WordPress, you know, for our blogs, they're like, well, we're not putting that in production. That's pretty horrible. Um, so they, but they do need to run WordPress at work, right? So they just finished rewriting this charming, like beautiful Python, it has unit tests, and, and things tie into Jenkins that's all passed. We get to run that in production, it's battle tested, Right, we know it's been audited um, by multiple security experts. It has all that awesome stuff, um, and now I can share that <coughs> with anybody. So if I was if I was still at Oakland today, I could leverage another more team more professional than mine. I could leverage that code to do good stuff, which I couldn't really do with um, with with the public modules that I've written. Um, but I really think it's kind of nice that we force you to do that way. That that helps for sharing. And that's also what makes it really nice for you to get something from Maria that's production ready. So when you hit add unit, you know it works, right? Like, because there's tests and <coughs> Jenkins and stuff. It's not like the old days of open source, we used to just like <coughs> publish things and, hey, no, no bug reports are coming in, it must be working. That's not, that's not really cool. Um, so we've got these two things. So we scaled our database layer, we know that's good to go. Um, we got the blog, but we only have one WordPress. Now, we know we needed the load balancer in front um, because I want to make it nice and slick. I don't want my users to run into like a, uh, you ever go to a website that's getting like slashed out of for the first time and then like everything's broken, but you keep eating F5 anyway and then eventually it comes back up because the guy in the background is like secretly doing stuff. That's what we're going to do except we're going to make it so the users don't know. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, do you add relation? 
and then what did I call this? Awesome load balancer. This is why I don't work at IS, I just name things like that. Um, and then Pegleton blog. How many of you set up a HA proxy or something similar? Anyone using Nginx load balancing? It's my favorite thing. Okay, cool. Um, so we're going to do that. So what's happening is certain hooks are firing off on the WordPress side of things, and certain things are firing off on the AJ proxy side of things. That allows this line to be drawn. So AJ proxy is adding this host. Um, actually, I think in this case, WordPress doesn't really care about the load balancer. Um, but what I did is when I created this line, you know when you set up WordPress, you kind of had, you kind of get, um, you get this going on. You have a machine, you install MySQL, and then you're waiting for that to install. You have a machine over here, or same machine, doesn't matter. Or let's just say containers, everyone's all about containers, right? You have two containers, you're installing MySQL. You install WordPress, right? Before you can complete your WordPress installation, right, you have to go back to MySQL, you gotta get its IP address, right? Then you put the My IP address here, and then you hit a button. Then stuff happens, WordPress sends over to MySQL, sorry, very ADB. Wow, I really the same that. Um, or actually, yeah, in this case, WordPress drop and replacement, WordPress doesn't know it's talking to Maria, right? It sends stuff over to the database, hey, create my table, do all this, bam, 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 that happens. And then eventually you hit finish, and, and then you get a working blog, right? This, this ping-ponging and waiting, I can't do this until I need this to come up, right? Solving that is, is, is generally what Juju does. I'm trying to explain how, how Juju works here. So in this simple case of a small, data, uh, a small database for your blog, you're like, oh, okay, well, that's not really, okay, neat. Um, but like I said, deploying WordPress is kind of a solved problem. Um, however, when you get to more and more complex services, like say, I don't know. When you get to say OpenStack, which is so big that we can't even make it a pretty picture, it has to be a grid, right? If you look at the amount of services it takes to run your own cloud, um, all of a sudden waiting for certain machines to do certain things, and then executing things in order, and then the other stuff, gets even more complex. And this is the base bundle. This is. Sixteen, and this is without Solometer. This is without. Um, you know, all the building stuff that connects. This is, this is a very simple base open stack line. So the reason I'm kind of explaining it in the, in the word plus context is to show you that even though when you're setting up and you might figure out how to automate those two units, once you get to like, I hate using this word, web scale, it gets a little complicated, right? How many of you have tried to deploy like Hadoop at work or something? Where it gets like really complicated um, and you're like, oh man, maybe I should just go home for the weekend. Um, <laughs> so we've, I'm going to go ahead and unexpose this because, well, actually I should leave that exposed. I'm going to go ahead and expose the load balancer and then I'm going to commit that. The GUI is kind of cool, it tells you like all the changes that you can before you do it. Um, or you could use the command line, I'm just going to knock back and forth here to kind of show you that works. And then we'll go to awesome load balancer. Hey. So. In my, in my uh, IT guy sysadmin, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to update my DNS somewhere <coughs> and get all the load starting to hit this instead of the WordPress unit itself, right? After DNS updates, then I can go ahead and ensure that WordPress is not talking directly to the internet. Right? Yeah. Okay, so here comes the magical bit. We scale the database bit, and now we're going to scale the application itself. Pretend this is your web application at work, or this could be a Rails application, this could be a Node application, it doesn't matter. Maria don't care, it's just serving. It's like, I don't care about your dumb PHP app. I'm just here to be a database. Um, so we can come here and say, you know, let's add, you know, I can't type in that field, I think it's my browser. So we would say, juju add unit, pangocon blog, so we got a pangocon. Thank you. It's PenguinCon, so let's get three instances. And the GUI will respond right away. 
Now, what's really awesome is, is the guy who did the load balancer bit is also not dumb. So he, this charm ensures that any of these WordPress instances that are not deployed and not reporting ready are not live. So if we go back to the load balancer and keep hitting F5, it will never send us to a broken unit, which is like awesome. Um, but I'm sure you guys believe that. So uh, there's that. So in like less than an hour, we've, we've created like a horizontally scalable application. And that's just WordPress with this example. That could be whatever app you got. And then we've done the database tier as well. In fact, I could go crazier. And does anyone know the secret trick to making WordPress scale? Yell it out if you know. It's like my favorite tool of all time. So static pages, not the price. I agree. The secret to making lots of things. Yes. Cash. Yes. Cash. yes. So we will we will add cash here to WordPress. I'm not doing any manual configuration at this point because this is automation software, so I'm going to trust the person that fixes this. So that will happen. We'll let that go. Actually, that term is broken, so I know it will break um, and, and not work with WordPress, but I am in the process of fixing that. I apologize. But you get the idea, right? You can take a service that you want, connect it to another service. It's really good. So let's look about how that, how that really works. Um, but before I get there, here's another stack. Um, that we worked on. We worked with you guys on this, or was this just us and IBM? Oh, well, we worked together. Yeah. Okay. Turbo Lamp Stack. Yeah, so we call this a Turbo Lamp Stack. Um, how many of you guys have heard of IBM Power? Power Machines, it's an architecture. Um, so Power's kind of back. They opened it, they call it Open Power now, so you can actually buy machines that are Power Architecture. Uh, what? It's the old PowerPC. What? It's the new PowerPC. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. All right. <laughs> well, see, this is structure set before, though. Yes. Well, yeah. but but Power Eight over Power is a little ending, whereas Power has always been big ending. Right. So there is a slight newness. Okay. Yeah. Just pretend it's brand new. I, I I tell people just all that old baggage. Remember the old IBM Power that took like forty five minutes to boot. Then they have that code you have to look at in the book. You're not doing that. No. It's really good. Um, but it is little ending, which means that like. Uh, porting software over to Power is just a recompile. Um, so you can buy an IBM Power Server or whatever. You can put Ubuntu on it. The ISO is like in the same releases directory as everything else except Power. Um, so in this case, we were able to make a really highly optimized um, database with Zen and then Mellanox, which uh, on that hardware you get like the accelerated Ethernet and InfiniBand craziness. Um, but like we said, we like portability. So I actually deployed this on Amazon. Uh, with, uh, uh, which is on x86. Now I won't get all the cool benefits of power, but I'm just kind of showing how portable we really like to make things, including getting that stuff running on power. I don't know if you guys make ARM binaries. No, but you, you, do, you do for us. Okay, all right. And you can also do this on ARM as well. So I don't know if you guys have seen Scaleway. This is pretty sweet. This is your homework for when you get home, and I promise you'll like this. Ooh, I didn't know this existed. Yes. So these guys are basically DigitalOcean, except instead of a VPS, you get a dedicated little arm box that they made, which is nice. You don't get noisy neighbor problems, right? You ever go on like a VPS and it's all slow because some other guy on that machine is doing stuff, and isolation doesn't really exist in that context. Um, so I think I'm losing internet, but um, arm is just lower spot. That's like one every day. Oh, okay, all right. But these are these are relative. You be so you get you get you get a quad core. You get a decent amount of RAM. I was pleasantly surprised at how performant it was. Um, you say ARM, people think it's just a bunch of iPhones or something in a server. Like, like, there are some cool things there, but yeah, they're pretty cool. And more importantly, oh, here's what it looks like. More importantly, they also natively support Juju, so you can deploy it to these natively. Um, so it's pretty cool. It's relatively cheap. They have SSDs. UI is really nice. Um, actually, I feel really bad. We should have spun up on this. This is pretty yeah. sweet. How much time is I think it's nine euros a month, something like that. They have different sizes. Well, they're scalable with the other services. Yes, yes, absolutely. So now, so now you can actually get ARM in the cloud. You just can't get power in the cloud. Yes. 
Uh, you can. I'm trying to see what the price is. Okay. A little power in the. Uh, What's the price? It's the idea. 10 euros in the last. They bought. It takes 200. If, yeah, if you want power, you can go with. Uh, I forget the name though. Yeah. Right? Soft layer. Soft, Soft layer. layer. Yeah. Uh, they they plan to, right? So, 9 99 euros a month, that's what, 15 bucks? Something like that? They shipped us a bunch of power boxes and we're like, really? Yeah. <laughs> Send them to us.